and today's Friday. It's Friday, okay? So, and we're finishing up MRI. This is ECE 637 Digital Image Processing 1. And um, I also want to let everyone know out there, for all the clueless individuals, that Sunday is Valentine's Day, okay? So don't forget that. Uh, it's dangerous to forget that. So uh, today we're going to finish MRI. Okay, so if uh, the last time, I guess we could, I, uh, maybe I'll go to the computer and do it there because I thought uh, it wasn't so bad, really. I don't know, how do people feel about using the computer display as opposed to the uh, uh, piece of paper? I feel like, I wish I'd like, uh, this doesn't allow a continuous variation in um, resolution. It's sort of like fixed. Can I, I, fit width. Oh, width is good, I think. Um, okay, so, so here's the thing. So, so you have um, uh, the receive signal, right? The, you receive a signal on the, uh, uh, so you have an antenna. You've done a slice select, that's an antenna, and then you put the antenna into an RF amplifier, okay? And then you put it into what's called a mixer. A mixer just multiplies two signals. Now you can't really multiply uh, two signals at RF frequencies. Uh, but it turns out that uh, a, a good enough approximation to multiplication is just to put it into a diode, uh, actually a diode bridge. So it actually does an XOR kind of a switch. But it, uh, it means that the multiplication is very approximate, but it's good enough because uh, all the uh, distortions get sort of filtered out if you work through the math. But it's essentially you multiply by e to the j omega zero t. It's called demodulation. So then this is the demodulated signal. And what comes out of there, okay, is uh, this. Um, okay, the pen here is okay, but it's not that great. So I can't really write real precisely. So it's, um, this thing is the, uh, how do I write? Okay. Oh, let me change colors. And I can be very clever. So I'll pick red. So this is exactly that. So that's what this means here. This means you just take the received signal, R of X, R of T is a received signal. You demodulate it. And what comes out of uh, the demodulated value, this is going to be a complex number, okay? Um, you'd say, well, that's not complex, okay? But the way you really do this in physical world is that you do what's called I and Q demodulation, okay? In phase and quadrature. Um, it, the way you learn about the, uh, in undergraduate class is that you get two mixers, one with the sine and one with the cosine. So you'll get two signals out. Oh, you also have to have a low-pass filter here. I forgot to put that in there. I mean, it's sort of in my head, but I forgot. You need low-pass filter, okay? Uh, otherwise, to, you need to... In practice, you really almost don't even need to put the low-pass filter because the electronics won't pass the higher frequency. So what will end up happening is you'll get the baseband signal. So that will be the... Comp, that will be... Now, mathematically, this would be the complex signal, but in practice, the way you actually physically do this on a real piece of hardware is that you have two mixers, one for the sine and one for the cosine, and you get what's called the in-phase and quadrature, or I and Q channels. One represents the real value, and the other is the complex value. That's also an approximation to the truth, because that's not how they really do it. The way they really do it is that they use a sine wave and they mix it down to what's called an intermediate frequency 
when they sample it with the DDA converter and then they uh, do the demodulation and di digitally because it's less expensive to do digital logic these days and it's much more precise, okay? So the bottom line is some magic occurs and you get the complex number digitally, okay? So the complex number you get is the Fourier transform of the object evaluated at minus kx and minus ky, okay? kx and ky. So kx represents the position in the, the spatial frequency domain. So it's the Fourier transform of the object. It's the spatial frequency domain along the x and y-axis. So this is what we were formally calling u and v, right? When we talked about the Fourier transform. But it's u and v uh, sort of U and V were independent variables. We could set them to anything we wanted, right? But here, their U and V are, are set to particular values of KXT and KYT. So we get, the complex number we get out of here is the value of the Fourier transform for some particular value of U and V, okay? But the good news is that we have control over what those particular values are because we have control over kx and ky. Does that make sense? Are there any questions about that? Okay, so this is pretty slick how you can draw on this and it moves, huh? So let's go back and look at what kx and ky were. So these are the actual formulas for kx and ky. Uh, if you go back and, the, uh, and look at them. Okay, well, actually, this formula is a little bit more. Let's actually go the other direction. Uh, let's see, where is kx and ky? Oh, here it is. Here's the formula for kx and ky. So, uh, g is the gradient. It's the strength of the gradient. So G determines the amount of slope or the gradient of the in the X direction and GY is the slope or gradient in the Y direction, right? And those will be controlled as a function of time. The way they're controlled is that uh, there's going to be a coil. Symbolically, I'm drawing it like this. And there's a current source. That's a current source, um, and and the current source is going to be. Um, so what is happening is that uh, G X. So if this is uh, the current here, so uh, the current is going to be proportional to G X. Okay. So that's the current. I'll call that I X. Okay. So Ix there will be proportional to Gx. Gx is is uh, is actually the gradient. So the great the Gx here has units of of uh, of uh, Teslas per meter, right? Because it's the actual physical gradient. Yes. Question. Is Gx a maximum gradient strength or just a gradient strength? No, it's not the maximum. It's the component of the gradient in the x direction. So let's go back and look at the um, at the definition. And so we recall what it is, because I mean it's this uh, we're layering a lot of different thoughts, so you have to keep them straight. Because usually, like we say that, for example, three Tesla scanner has a maximum gradient strength of thirty to forty-five milli Tesla per meter, but that's not this what we're talking about. This. Okay, could, could, I, I think the answer to your question is yes, but could you repeat it a little more slowly so I make yes, sorry, sure I understand sorry. it? <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's good. You know, I, and I apologize to everybody because, you know, it's hard for me to hear for two reasons. One is that the voices get a little muffled by the cloth, yeah. and the other is that when I don't visually see your mouth moving, sometimes it's hard to sync up the words. Yeah. So, at 3 Tesla, the maximum gradient strength is about 30 to 45 millitesla per meter. Yeah. So... Would that mean that 
here, GX, you said it's not a maximum, but yeah, that's what I was wondering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's maximum. an excellent question. So, so this is the gradient. So, so you're, you're asking in the physical experiment, like uh, people will specify the maximum gradient strength, mm -hmm. for example. The maximum gradient strength for a problem like this, uh, so what you could actually calculate it. Um, let me write it over here on the side. Let's see if I. It would be like so. So essentially, the gradient here would be gx. Okay, right. So that's like a. This is basically a component of the gradient, right? So and you could actually. So for your problem, the the you would have like gy, and you'd have gz. Right, and if you wanted to compute the maximum gradient strength, you take you take the square of these, you'd add them, and you take the square root because it's a vector quantity. Okay, and the maximum gradient strength is important because uh, it turns out that, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, the FDA regulates that. So you don't you want the gradient to uh, well, okay, it's not actually that that's regulated. It's the rate of change of the maximum gradient strength, okay? Because you don't, uh, and the reason is this. If, the, uh, uh, if you have a changing magnetic field, it creates an electric field, right? That's how a motor works. When in a coil in a motor, um, if you, I mean, I'm sure, well, probably uh, people have, if you put a voltmeter here, I don't, how do you draw a voltmeter? I forget. Uh, a, a current meter. If you put a current meter here, if you took, uh, this is a classic experiment you do in like maybe junior high or something like that. You, you take a coil, wrap it around, like what you get is a, um, a paper towel roll, okay? And uh, like, you know, the thing, in, the cardboard thing inside a paper towel roll, I think that actually has a name. It's called a spindle, okay? But, and you take that, you wrap a piece of wire around it, okay? And then you take a magnet, like a bar magnet, these days they have really high power magnets because they have these uh, rear earth materials. And you push it in and out, it'll cause a current in the, in the wire, okay? So a changing magnetic field causes the, a, a changing electric field, and a changing electric field also causes a changing magnetic field, okay? So, uh, so uh, that's why Maxwell's equations work, because dB dt causes dE dt. That's why when a light wave, you have a magnetic field going one way and an electric field going the other way, and they're out of phase, okay, because uh, one sort of induces the other. Okay, but anyway, so if you have a rapidly changing uh, magnetic field, it will cause a, 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 a changing electric field. So an electric field will cause current to flow, right? So, uh, so what will happen is if you, have a ra if you have a changing magnetic field, it causes current to flow in your body. If you let, if you have the changing magnetic field change too rapidly, it'll cause uh, a, enough current to flow in your body that it will stimulate your peripheral nervous system. Like, so essentially, it would be like giving you a shock. Okay, and if you give a person a shock, what'll happen is they'll get, um, you'll get. Uh, involuntary motor response, right? So basically your muscle will contract or expand, you know, and people will twitch, okay? So, you know, I don't know that that has any lasting uh, adverse effect, but people don't like it, okay? I mean, you don't want people like, uh, it would be like people, uh, you know, giving you electric shocks or something. You, you, you find that unpleasant. So they don't want to do that. So the FDA uh, has done extensive tests, many of which were done in the early days at Purdue. So they have tables and they say, well, you're not supposed to have more than a certain maximum rate of change of magnetic field strength per unit time. I'm not an expert on this, so I, I'm sure that the, these sort of regulations have become more sophisticated with time. But the manufacturers of the... Uh, of the uh, uh, MRIs have to make sure that for clinical use, uh, these various regulations are met. There's, uh, in some cases, they can get exemptions for research application. 
as long as uh, you know under the correct conditions. In that case, you have uh, what's called an IRB or internal, uh, which is a internal review board that that uh, you see oversight to make sure that everything's done carefully and that the patients, uh, uh, whatever uh, a human subjects, uh, you know, understand what's happening and they can do various tests that would make sure they do them safely. But for clinical application, you have to follow these FDA regulations uh, so that the, they have to be very careful about this number. So, uh, but these numbers I've specified here are just the components of the gradient in the different, in the three axes. But from that, you can compute the magnitude and uh, direction of the gradient. Uh, field in any direction, right? So does that make sense? And and let me just emphasize one more time. The magnetic field is a vector, okay? But I'm sort of a, I was making the approximation that the direction of the vector doesn't change here, that only the magnitude of the, of the, of the magnetic field vector changes. And, um, you know, they attempt to make it so that's true. Nothing's perfect. <laughs> but that's the approximation, all right? So you understand what these gradients are? And remember, we used the Z gradient for the slice select, but then our assumption was that we fixed it, okay? So it no longer matters. It, it, in that slice select, the, uh, uh, the Z gradient is constant. Uh, the, the value of the magnetic field uh, is constant there, okay? Okay, so now what happens is... Um, after the so the so the slight select is like plucking the violin string. I'm going to use that analogy for the rest of my life. I hope you don't mind because I think it's uh, you know, quite good. So the um, it's like you pluck the violin string, and now the violin string is vibrating, and you now change the gradients uh, in time along the x and the y axis. And what will happen is that. Because the magnetic field is changing locally, the frequency that the that the string is vibrating at will shift. Okay, it's like you're modulating the frequency. So what will end up happening then is we go through all these calculations and we get that expression that I showed you. But now uh, kx and ky are what? Kx are is going to be the integral of the gradient in time, this is a time integral, and ky is the integral of the y gradient in time. So, uh, so the gradient, so then the derivative in time for the grade, uh, for k is gonna be the great, is gonna be proportional to the gradient. So if the derivative in time for some quantity is proportional to something, right, that means that uh, the analogy is that the that that this thing, the gradient here, is the velocity. Because if I if I uh, if I plot say kx, this is t, and this is kx of t, right? If I um, if this quantity looks like this, right? Then it means its its derivative in time is constant. If its derivative in time is constant, that means uh, gx of t must be constant, right? Because, uh, right? So if g of x of t is zero, then this thing will be constant. It will be zero. I mean, it won't be zero, but it's it'll be flat, right? It'll be unchanging. So gx represent is analogous to the velocity of kx, right? If gx is positive, then kx will be increasing with time. If gx is negative, it will be decreasing with time, right? Okay, now, um, but gx is proportional to current. So I'll make a little proportionality. Oh, okay. This pen is okay, but it's not as good as writing on paper. Um, so ix is proportional to g. The gradient is proportional to current. Let me try that again because I think that, <coughs> excuse me. How do I erase? Oh, let me try that again. 
Ix, that's the current, is proportional to Gx. So Gx is proportional to Ix. You double the current through the coil, you'll double the gradient, right? Okay, but here's the thing that's interesting. As I pointed out with the vacuum cleaner, when you have a discontinuous current, it produces an extremely high voltage, okay? It's like if you have a hammer, right? And you the reason hammers are effective is because an instantaneous change in velocity of a, of a heavy mass produces an infinite spike in force, okay? Right? Because uh, so the, the velocity of the hammer is like the current. The current wants to keep moving. It has momentum. Maybe that's a good way of thinking that. The current has like momentum. So if you try to stop the current instantly, it produces a very large force, which is the voltage, okay? So, uh, so the current, so the voltage uh, is equal to the time derivative of the current times the inductance, which uh, I think we use as the letter N. I forget. Maybe it's an M. Okay. So the inductance. So the coil will have some inductance to it. It'll be pretty inductive because coils naturally have a lot of inductance. So, um, so the important thing is here that the uh, the voltage will be the derivative of the current. So the the gradient. Okay, kx is the integral of the gradient, right? That means the current is the integral of the voltage. If the voltage is the derivative of the current, the current is the integral of the voltage. So the the uh, this kx will be the second integral of the voltage. So so what's the analogy? The analogy is that the voltage is like the acceleration. Because uh, for the kx, so an accelerator pedal in your car roughly controls the acceleration, right? It doesn't control the velocity. Actually, it's kind of interesting. If you have cruise control, then you have direct control over the velocity, right? Because if you increase the cruise control, the car goes faster. If you reduce it, it goes slower. If you leave it alone, it it stays constant velocity, at least the old-fashioned cruise control. And uh, so, uh, so uh, yeah, and it has its pluses and minuses, right? But, uh, but whereas the accelerator controls the acceleration. So the accelerator is, is the, so the velocity is the, uh, I'm sorry, the position is the second integral of the acceleration. And the uh, position is the first integral of the velocity. So, so what happens? So let's go down and look at this. So that's what these equations are here. Um, the point here is that, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't use an M, I used an L. So the, the velocity, uh, the velocity, the voltage is the derivative of the current, okay? And, and uh, the gradient is proportional, oh, this is the M. The gradient is proportional to the current. So what ends up happening, if you work through it, is that uh, the kx is the second integral of the voltage times some constant. And uh, ky is the second integral of the, the voltage on the, I mean, these are the voltages across the two coils times the second integral, okay? So, uh, and the voltage is sort of the thing you control. So what ends up happening is that the way you think of it is that you're driving around kx, ky space. And why do you want to drive around kx, ky space? Because you want to collect the data you need to do the reconstruction. So remember, the kx and ky, uh, K, uh, the uh, um, MRI imaging came out of, largely out of the physics community. In field. So, uh, for some reason, uh, you know, every uh, technical community has its own technical culture. Okay, so 
what ends up happening is in the in the in the electrical engineers use like the letter J. <laughs> That's a dead giveaway, by the way. You can always tell electrical engineers because if you ask, if you want to find out what somebody's technical training is, ask them what the what letter. Write down the square root of minus one because an electrical engineer will write that, and uh, like a mathematician or physicist will write that. Okay. Okay. Obviously, they're wrong. So, uh, okay, whatever. So it's the square root of, and of course, electrical engineers use J because they used I for current. Okay, so they could they, that letter was already used up. So um, they so uh, in the same vein, uh, electrical engineers use F for frequency, right? But physicists use K. So in the electromagnetics literature, which is kind of driven a lot by physicists. Um, they use k, so that's why we're using k because it's the frequency variable that frequency that physicists like to use. So what happens? We drive around this space, okay, and we collect data. It's like going on a quest. Isn't there some kind of thing people do where they drive around and look for things with uh, the uh, with uh, the GPSs? Geocaching. Geocaching. It's like geocaching, okay? You drive around the space and you collect data. And you need to find, because uh, this is the, Fourier, you're, you're collecting the Fourier transform, right? Uh, so if I want to use the correct notation, it's kx and ky. Now, the only thing that's different is that uh, it's flipped because it's minus kx and minus ky, but that's a detail. So you have to drive around the space and collect enough data. Now, uh, and then once you collected all the data, you take the 2D inverse 2D Fourier transform and you reconstruct the image. Now, uh, what will happen is that, so you'd say, well, where do I need to drive, all right? So there's kind of two big issues. One is how big a region you drive. So the size of the region, so this is Kx, and this is KY. Okay, and the other thing is how finely you cover it, right? So, I mean, are you going to do really closely spaced lines or lines that are far apart? Along each line, of course, you can sample you you can sample in time as you're driving along these lines. So, that shouldn't be a big issue. You can sample as finely as you want. But you do have to pick how close these lines are going to be assuming you do it a rest or order in this direction. So, and by the way, this thing represents spatial resolution in the vertical direction, and this represents spatial resolution in the horizontal direction, right? So now, so uh, now you'll, this is like you're doing a geocaching and you want to win. So you want to get done first. I think that's the goal of geocaching. So you want to try to make it through this obstacle course as quickly as possible. So of course you want to get a fast car that has a lot of acceleration, okay? And really good brakes, okay? And then you want to drive as quickly as you can, but if you make the course smaller, of course you can get through it faster, right? So one of the issues is that you would like to limit the region, this is, I'll call this the region of interest, ROI. So you want to limit the ROI. What is the disadvantage of making this ROI smaller? Excuse me? You might undersample your data. Uh, you sort of answered, it's the right qu answer to the wrong question. <laughs> okay? But it's a good try. Okay, undersample, hold that thought, okay? Because it's the correct answer, but not, but I, I'm first talking, I'd like to be able to draw the handle, I mean, now, I want to know if I make this thing bigger. This is the frequency domain, right? So if I make it bigger in the frequency domain, the region bigger, what does that, what happens in the, in terms of the spatial domain? Because remember, I take the inverse Fourier transform of this, yeah? You can resolve higher frequencies. You can resolve higher frequencies, right? Because this is just like a filter, <clears throat> only it's in space. In time, remember, the wider the bandwidth of the filter, the higher resolution you have in time. So remember, things get bigger in space, in frequency, they get smaller in time. What that means by smaller, it means that the, 
resolution increases because you, the point spread function or the impulse response is smaller, okay? So as I make this thing bigger, the benefit of that will be that, <clears throat> say it again, just to reinforce, it's good to say because when you say it, your body responds to that and you remember it, okay? So as this gets bigger, as this gets, I wish I could see, uh, this is the one disadvantage of the electronic thing. As this gets bigger, what happens? I get more resolution. And if it gets bigger in this direction, if it gets bigger in this direction that I'm drawing in red, what, what particular resolution will increase? Uh, the horizontal, right? And if I grow it this way, I'll, use, I'll be fancy and use a different color. If I grow it this way, what will increase? The vertical resolution, right? So if I want more resolution to see finer detail, I'll, I'll want to scan a larger region so that I get higher, more frequencies, okay? Sorry, I'm confused. I know another Yeah, question. no, this is, a, I really appreciate you saying that, by the way, because it's really, this stuff is, yeah, these are excellent questions. Wouldn't they want to be vertical because of the scanner? Like, uh, sorry, horizontal and X up and down, so wouldn't we increase things? Wouldn't it be opposite of what we just said for... Uh, You're talking about KX versus KY? Yeah. Well, first of all, I should preface this by saying that everything I'm saying is a little misleading because the KX and the KY depends totally on our conventions, okay? okay. So, it, it, you, know, you know, in practice, when you do this sort of stuff, you have to kind of... You like just try it and see what comes out because there's a lot of places where you can get, you know, things flipped. Okay. But at least in principle, the way I've described it, I'm saying KX is the Fourier transform coefficient associated with the X coordinate. So increasing, uh, increasing the scan out to, in this direction, okay, will take higher spatial frequency components along the X dimension. Okay, so if I go look at the equation, where, okay, where, where by x dimension I mean that variable right there, okay? Now, you know, it kind of depends on how you're defining things, you're, but, but yes, but yeah. In any case, experimentally, you'll find that when you do this, uh, one of these increasing along one of these dimensions will increase either the horizontal or the vertical, and the other one will do the opposite, okay? So does that make sense? Now the problem is, is that, okay, intuitively, uh, you go through here and you scan, but then the question is how many lines do you need in your scan? Now, um, clearly if you just had like one line here one line here and one line here. You had three lines. You know, you wouldn't expect it to work very well, right? So somewhere, and if you had a zillion lines, where a zillion is arbitrarily large, it would be too much and it wouldn't be necessary because you would, it would be too slow. So somewhere between way too many and not enough, there must be the right number, the Goldilocks number. Now the question is, what's going to change as you change this, okay? As you change the spacing between these lines, what will change, okay? So that's a little more subtle, okay? So if I take this thing, that's delta ky. That's the spacing between the lines in this domain, okay? Ky has units of what? Um, actually, uh, let's just look at the Fourier transform definition. Okay, so kx and ky have units of of what? Radians? Oh. Um, radians per what? Per whatever, meter. Some unit of length. Not her, they don't have units of uh, cycles per meter, 
because uh, because there's no two pi in there. Okay, so uh, so so if I take uh, so that's radians per meter. So if I take um, two pi over delta kx, that has units of what meters distance. So remember, things that are small in the frequency domain correspond to things that are large in the space domain. So this is a small dimension because you have a lot of these lines and they're close together. So that's going to co correspond to the largest feature in space. So what will end up happening is that this thing has some kind of distance. We'll call it, okay, we'll call this a Tx, right? Uh, the one disadvantage of this is that I, I lose space for drawing, okay? So, okay, Tx. What will Tx determine? When you do your reconstruction, this is in space now. This is x and y. And this is your uh, reconstruction. So your reconstruction, let's say, looks like this. That's the picture of the person, OK? This dimension here will be uh, tx. Oh, I should have called this ty because there is no tx. The reason is, is that we're doing the scan pattern in raster order. We could do the scan pattern vertically uh, instead of horizontally. But in this application, there's only a Tx, uh, that, and that's a Kx. So this distance here is Ty. So that's the answer to the question. So the distance, so this spacing here between the scan lines determines the region of interest in the space domain. So if I make these lines too far apart, what will end up happening as these as Kx grows, Ty gets smaller. So as Ty gets smaller, eventually what will happen is the region of interest becomes too small to support the size of the object you're scanning. If that happens, what will end up happening is this. So I'll put Ty too small. What happens is this, and this is, I'm sorry, this is the answer you gave me to the previous question that I asked you to put on hold. So if you do this, what will happen is that if the region of interest is too, if Ty is too small, what will happen? Does anybody know? Okay, so one answer is it might cut it out. It actually doesn't happen that way because of the fact that these are lines, okay? And it's like a rep. It's actually a little bit worse than just cutting it out. If it just cut it out, it would be fine because then you could zoom into a region you cared about. It's worse than just cutting out. It's almost like aliasing. So basically, you got to guess at the answer because you don't really know enough to be able to answer it exactly. But just based on your intuition, what do you think might happen? You're getting close. Are we going to have an overlap? Either? You're going to have an overlap. So what ends up happening is it's like, in see, you don't have the you guys don't have all the fun I used to have when I was a kid, because we had regular televisions, and they would always have ghosting, because you get multipath. Uh, along the transmission from the antenna, so you'd have like a ver you'd have like the same person shifted a little bit, right? You get a ghost. So what happens is you're going to get two versions of the same object overlaid on top of each other, and the spacing between those two objects is what? Ty. Oops. Oh shoot. How come it's not letting me do it? Okay, there it is. It, I didn't do it with enough intensity. Once again, with intensity. You see what I'm saying? So 
here is the engineering trade-off. You need to move. You can need to separate the. You need to have enough lines so you, that your object doesn't overlap. Okay, and you need to have a, a big enough region. Okay, so that you get enough resolution. You could put the lines really close together. It, as you put the lines closer together, as they'll get. Then what will happen is you'll you'll separate these things out. And they won't overlap as much. But the price you'll pay for that is that the resolution will go down because the region you scan will get small. Okay? So that's the fundamental overlap. And that determines the speed at which you can acquire an MRI scan, which is a very important factor for a few reasons. First of all, some scans can take a long time, and people don't want to sit in the scanner for too long. Like anything beyond maybe a half an hour, right, is like too long. For sequence or for total scan? For total scan. Uh, it, one hour is like... Yeah, the minutes. one hour. I mean, if it's me, 15 minutes, okay? Because I get antsy, okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> but for more patient graduate students, um, maybe they can tolerate... But after an hour, I mean, you know, what are you going to do? You can't read a book. Well, no, well, they have, have now sometimes where you can read a book or something yeah, where they have a display... Uh, a, they have like a display that's um, uh, MR. Uh, Images or movies. Yeah, right. They can have techniques so they can keep you occupied. But the, the other problem is that if it's like an fMRI scan, they want to provide some sort of stimulus that they're trying to measure. So if they give you, have you watch a movie, if there's like a fight scene in it or something, it'll screw up the results because you'll they'll measure the stimulation you get from watching the action movie or something, you know. So, um, so yeah, so that's the trade-off, right? There's no free lunch. So now there's been a lot of research in how to create scan patterns that are more efficient because, you, as you might imagine, this is not the best possible scan pattern because uh, what will end up happening, for instance, if the person is moving and if it takes a half an hour to take a scan, you're going to get some motion because people can't sit that still especially if they're children, pediatrics. Motion is a big issue for pediatric applications. Then what will happen is the problem is, is that, you know, you're kind of doing very local measurements and they're moving. And by the time you get over here, the image has like kind of weird blurring effects. So they come up with other scan patterns. Uh, the one thing I have to figure out how to do is how to create a blank page. I wonder if there's a way to create a blank page. There must be a way. Huh? Is this it? No, no, that's a cancel. I don't know. This is, uh, yeah, it would be really neat if there was a way to create a blank page. I'll figure that out later. It's a learning experience, okay? So, um, so what they'll do is, okay, I'll do it over here. So in KX and KY space, this is uh, KX and this is KY. They might do a pattern that looks like this, like a helical, oops, I'm not doing it very well, but you can imagine. Does anybody ever, when they're kids, have a thing called spirograph? I love spirograph, okay? It's a little bit like spirograph, and that, uh, actually, GE used to have a scan pattern they called propeller. Do they still have propeller? Okay. Yeah, and, and one of the big selling features for it is that it has lower motion artifacts. Okay, but we still haven't said how you actually drive around the space. It, uh, how you actually drive around the space. So you want to uh, drive through this space like this. Okay, I had a lot of nice artwork here, but I think I'm going to have to delete it now. Sorry. Because I need, I need to draw some other things. Oh, oh, is there a thing that, I'm sorry, say it again? Oh, here, this? So, very good question. 
I think actually, I wonder if there's an easier way to to, to erase the board. Uh, no, I won't worry about it. So, um, okay, because you start off at zero, at least conceptually, okay? Oh, that's zero. Okay, so that's zero. That's the center of the coordinate system, so it's the DC. So for an EPI, uh, which is echoplanar imaging, uh, it's, uh, this is uh, MRI sequence. You start off by moving over here, okay? That, and then you go down the scan path like this. You don't have to do it this way, but that would be like a typical basic scan path, okay? Good question, okay? I wonder, if there must be a way of like deleting everything all at once, but I haven't figured it out yet. Okay, anyway, um, okay. So now, remember, uh, this is like you're driving around uh, frequency space, okay? So you're in your car, but the difference is between this car, this car is a little different than a regular car, in that the car is sort of like one of those, you know how they have those robots now that have like uh, wheels going in both directions so that they can, and what they do is on the wheels, they have like ball bearings so that the wheels can slide sideways. It's kind of clever. So anyway, so it's like a car where you can drive in any direction, right? And you have, well, first of all, you have, instead of having, uh, so normally in a car, you have like an accelerator pedal, at least for the next few years until they replace cars with something else. Uh, and you sit here. And then you're, that's your foot, right? And you step on the accelerator to go accelerate, but then you have to move your foot to the brake to stop, right? But I think uh, cars with regenerative uh, braking systems, like the Tesla, I don't own a Tesla, but maybe someone here has either owns one or has driven one. When you lift your foot off the gas, the actual car brakes. So that's a little bit like what I'm describing, because if you wanted to coast at a constant velocity, you actually have to keep your foot on the accelerator, right? So my point is that you'd have like a joystick. Imagine you drove your car with a joystick instead of an accelerator pedal. So you'd have a joystick here, and when you wanted to go forward, you push the joystick like that, and when you wanted to go backwards, you push the joystick like this. So you can, the way you would brake would be like, pulling back on the joystick, okay? But now the joystick would actually be two-dimensional because you you go forward, okay, back, okay? Then if you go left and you go right, okay? So you can, ex you can control your acceleration and deceleration in both X and Y direction. So here what you want, so you want to drive around this space with the joystick. So we'll start here because it's easier. You start at like zero, right? And then what happens is you first have to accelerate. And then once you accelerate to your maximum velocity, you stop accelerating and you coast. Okay? And then when you get here, you got to put the brakes on. So you start slowing down. Then once you hit that point, you start accelerating downward. And then you coast very, and then you come down here and you stop. And then you do the same thing again, right? So if you plotted out the position of the accelerator, well, first of all, you'd have to plot the accelerator for both the x and the y dimension. It would look something like this. So this is, uh, this is the acceleration in the x direction, OK? Well, this is the position. OK, this is the velocity in the x direction. And this is the acceleration. To get started, you know, you, you give it a little kick, OK? There also used to be like, and then they had this like 1950 science discovery uh, movies they made, like little TV shows. And I remember they had this one thing where they had like an air hockey table and they had a puck, okay? And they gave it a little kick. And once it kicks, then it just keeps gliding along until you stop it by giving it a kick in the opposite direction. So there's really only two kicks. You give it a kick to get it started and a kick to stop it. But the kick isn't instantaneous because you can't do that. You can't have an instantaneous kick because that would require an infinite uh, uh, gradient, um, an infinite great uh, slew rate on the gradient, which would induce uh, 
currents and cause peripheral nervous system stimulation that would be undesirable. So instead you, you give it sort of a continuous push and then stop. And then it coasts for this period, okay? And the, oh, we're out of time. Shoot, I lost track of the time. Okay. I think we'll have to go on to the next topic next. I looked up and I was getting confused about the time. I apologize for that. So thanks a lot. Uh, uh, yeah, we'll, I'll see you on Monday.